Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Intersection of Democracy and Hard History Through the Lens of Primary Sources, which is sponsored by ProQuest, part of Clarivate. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. Uh, in the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speaker. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. We might not have time to get to them all, but please do type your questions in. Um, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or want to be addressed. Uh, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will first hand it over to Barbara Olson who will introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Sabrina. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Olson. I am the Director of Product Marketing at ProQuest, which is now part of Clarivate. I'm thrilled to invite uh, to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who is an associate professor at The Ohio State University, which is my alma mater. I'm super thrilled to welcome him back to ACRL. Some of you may have heard him speak previously. Uh, in around April of 2020, he did a really interesting webinar that we had lots of attendees on, where he talked about confronting hard history. Today, he's going to be talking about a similar but slightly different topic. Uh, the title of his top, the this talk today is the intersection of democracy and hard history through the lens of primary sources. So Hassan, over to you. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for the for the welcome, uh, and most especially for the invitation to share some thoughts and ideas um, with this uh, collection of, of folk uh, who are interested uh, in uh, not just history, but the use of primary sources. Uh, and most especially, uh, I think as well, um, the in 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 the uh, uh, democracy uh, in America today. So I'm going to go ahead and, and and share my screen. I have some slides that I want to um, uh, to share with you all, and then we will reserve some time um, towards the bottom of the hour um, to to open things up for for questions, uh, conversation, uh, and 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 discussion. Uh, as Barbara pointed out, the uh, I, I've titled my remarks for for today um, the intersection of democracy and and hard history uh, through the lens of primary primary sources. Hard history, um, I like to think of as those aspects of our past that make us uncomfortable in the present, uh, that typically revolve around. Uh, questions of race and racism in American in American society. So those aspects of our past that make us uncomfortable in the present that very often revolve around questions of race and racism. And that is connected, uh, intricately connected to the way in which democracy uh, has been exercised and practiced in America from the founding uh, to and through the present and we can use primary sources to get at both, uh, to get at a better sense of what actually happened in the past, uh, confronting hard history directly, and the intersection between hard history and, and democracy. In 1873, in Colfax, Louisiana, a, a group of white men, announced that they were forming a racial terror group uh, patterned after the Ku Klux Klan that had been formed just uh, four or five years earlier in Pulaski, Tennessee. And the purpose of this group uh, was to, and they announced uh, once they had formed that they intended that their uh, initial purpose intent would be to march on the parish courthouse 
um, Grant Parish, about two hours north northwest of, uh, of of New Orleans, Louisiana, Colfax being the seat of the parish, uh, that they were going to march on the the, the parish Col the uh, um, parish courthouse in Colfax for the purpose of ousting the duly elected uh, public officials uh, who were a combination of African-American uh, men and white men who were Republicans. Uh, Louisiana in 1873 was one of only three states that had not uh, been taken back over uh, by former Confederates, those who uh, and expressed a, an allegiance to, to, to white supremacy. They had not fallen under uh, the control of Southern Democrats. And this was uh, uh, troubling to the extreme, um, to these uh, white uh, former Confederates uh, in Louisiana, in Grant Parish. So they said they're going to do something about it. And they're going to march on this court. They're going to march on this parish courthouse. When word of their intentions uh, reaches African Americans, a group of about 150 black. Uh, men, former soldiers, former Union soldiers, decide that they can't let this happen. Decide that they are going to not only defend those who were duly elected, these Republican office soldiers who were duly elected to office, um, but that they were also going to defend democracy, right? Uh, and so they gather their, their weapons and they head down to the parish courthouse and they take up a defensive position. Not long after their arrival, this uh, members of this racial terror group, um, backed and supported by the larger members of the uh, white white community, uh, by more members of the white community, they show up. They are armed to the teeth, including bringing with them a Confederate issue cannon. Uh, and not long after they arrive, they open fire on those African-American men who had taken up defensive positions inside and outside of the courthouse as depicted here. It is not long uh, after uh, this skirmish, this battle begins, if you will, uh, that those former black soldiers realize that they are both outnumbered and outgunned uh, and that their only recourse, the only way that they were going to be able to to survive would, would, was if they laid down their arms uh, and surrendered. And, and, and so they do. Um, they, they, they wave the, the white flag and they, they head out of the parish courthouse. But as they do, and soon after they do, every single one of those black men who emerged from that uh, courthouse, every single one of them uh, who had not been wounded during the initial exchange of gunfire, Every single one of those men was shot dead. Uh, and those African-American men who were in, who remained inside the courthouse because they had been wounded, uh, they are all dragged outside and, and lynched. In all, 150 Black men uh, are murdered uh, that day in April of 1873. That was the Colfax Massacre. Fast forward 100 and, and well, 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 before we do that, Colfax massacre was not unique. It was reflective of what was happening at the time, an effort by white Southerners to regain political control of the South through the use of violence and terror. Uh, and we see it replicated uh, in community after community after community, and it is successful. Reconstruction is not uh, Reconstruction does not fail. This attempt to reimagine the South uh, as a more democratic, as a multiracial, multi uh, multiracial society that embraces and allows African Americans to be a part of the body politic. This this effort to bring about that multiracial democracy does not fail. That effort is defeated. It's defeated at the hands of white supremacists uh, who are determined. Uh, to regain power, to exclude African Americans, and they're willing to use violence to do it. Um, the, the, the source evidence for this is quite clear, uh, and, and, and ProQuest, ProQuest makes available uh, in its history vault, and that's what I'll just be referencing that because I know so many of us um, you know, have access to that. Um, the records of 
this 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 period during Reconstruction, congressional testimony, um, letters sent to the uh, United States Attorney General that are testifying to the use of violence um, to to prevent African American men who are enfranchised with the Fifteenth Amendment in 1870 uh, to participate in the political process. And of course, in 1867, or uh, three years earlier, uh, African Americans through um, the Reconstruction Act, uh, black men are granted um, uh, voting rights. Uh, and so there's a three year period even before we get to 1870 and before we get to 1873 in which African American men are registering and participating in the political process and the use of violence in response to that happens immediately. And the testimony that we see of African Americans and others, um, uh, Republican officials, military uh, officials on the ground writing back uh, to the um, uh, attorney general testifying before Congress to the use about the use of violence right and so one of the things in which we can use primary sources for uh, is specifically to look at this moment that makes clear that reconstruction was not um, did not fail but rather was intentionally defeated but if we fast forward um, 75 75 years or so uh, Louisiana uh, the state of Louisiana um, the Department of Commerce and Industry in 1950 would erect an historical historic marker at the site of the Colfax massacre. Uh, and the wording of this historic marker is so critically important because it reflects the ways in which we as a society, as an American society, have tended to misremember very intentionally the, this uh, hard history, right? In this particular instance, uh, what we see, what, what took place in Colfax, Louisiana. So this marker reads, uh, Colfax riot. On this site occurred the Colfax riot in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. This event on April 13, 1873, marked the end of carpet bagman's rule in the South. In, in these 30 some words, uh, we see the typical response to hard history. Uh, one, uh, it is, uh, the purposeful uh, creating of a false narrative, right? Uh, the, the, the attempt to rationalize away what actually occurred, the evil that occurred. And we see that in the renaming. This is called a riot and not a massacre. Uh, this was, uh, by every uh, stretch of the imagination, a massacre in which 150 African-Americans were murdered, were slain. But by saying it was a riot, somehow shifts responsibility right, onto the shoulders of African-Americans, and they were the ones who were, in fact, there defending democracy. Uh, but we also see, I mean, that's, that's just making stuff up, uh, but we also see one of the typical responses to hard history is this attempt to rationalize away what occurred, right, to justify it, to rationalize the evil action that occurred on that day. And we see this in that second sentence uh, by saying that the event um, mark the end of carpet bagman's rule in the South. In other words, this violence was necessary uh, on the part of, of, of white folk in Louisiana in order to preserve democracy because reconstruction uh, was an attempt uh, to, what was politics run amok, right? I mean, it was uh, an effort to undermine uh, the civil order, civil society uh, by empowering African, African Americans. And then the third aspect that's captured um, in this in this historic marker um, is, 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 this, is, is, is what actually occurs later on. Um, up until the 18, 1960s, 1970s, uh, the Colfax massacre is taught uh, within Louisiana public schools as the Colfax riot for these reasons, right? Uh, because it reinforces uh, and justifies the use of racial violence in the name of, of white supremacy. But once African-Americans um, are successfully desegregate public schools in Louisiana, then suddenly, uh, rather than teach the Colfax riot as it actually occurred as a massacre, suddenly it just fades away from the textbooks completely. It's dropped from the curriculum. I mean, one of the things that we do, rather than confronting hard history directly, uh, is we we embrace or suffer from purposeful historical amnesia. We just pretend as though these aspects of the past just simply did not occur. 
And we do that in Louisiana with the Colfax massacre. We do it in Wilmington, North Carolina. Historically, we've done that with the Wilmington massacre in 1898. Uh, we've done it in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, in 1921. Uh, with the burning of that and destruction of that community there, why so many people just last year had never heard about it. purposeful historical amnesia. Why is it important that we actually remember these stories for the way in which they occurred? It's not just simply because we should never forget history, right? It's because that this history still has resonance today and helps explain Right? Understanding the past, understanding these difficult aspects of our past, help us make sense of the present today. On January 6, 2021, we saw something that should have surprised and, 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 and or shocked and did shock me and, and should have shocked uh, just about everyone else. Uh, an attempt to uh, use violence to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We had never seen this before. Uh, in, in, in United States history, what took place at the nation's capital on January 6th. We should have been surprised but or shocked, but we should not have been surprised because had we understood our history, had we been paying attention and confronted hard history, these difficult aspects of the past, particularly around the way in which democracy has been limited in the United States, then what we saw on January 6th would not have surprised us because we've seen it before. Colfax, what drove those uh, white Southerners in Colfax to use violence to, to regain control of the county courthouse was the same motivation that drove uh, these tens of thousands of people to descend on the uh, nation's capital on January 6th. In Colfax, Louisiana, uh, those white folk were upset by Black participation in the political process. They believe, despite the 15th Amendment, that Black participation in the political process was illegitimate. Their mere participation was illegitimate, and therefore, the outcome of any election that was dependent upon Black participation, or which African Americans proved to be a decisive voice, vote, uh, a decisive voice uh, and vote in that outcome, that somehow that election was illegitimate. And we saw the same motivation driving the people uh, who descended on the nation's capital on January 6th. Uh, when the former president uh, began to talk about um, this big lie, uh, began to talk about uh, 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 the election having been stolen, where did he say the corruption occurred? It occurred in Atlanta, Georgia. It occurred in Detroit, Michigan. It occurred in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It, it occurred in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It occurred where Black people cast ballots. The same motivation, this idea that Black participation in an election, uh, a decisive participation could render that election illegitimate is not America repeating itself. It's America continuing, right? It never stopped, like that, that same belief. The most powerful political organizing tool in American history has been racism, and it continues to be. And we saw it deployed in 1873, and we saw it deployed on January 6th. What is clear? What, what is clear to those who showed up on January 6th was this belief that a multiracial democracy was the principle, is a principal threat to white supremacy, that white supremacy cannot exist as long as you have a multi, a true multiracial democracy. That animated these people on January 6th and it animated those just like it animated people in Colfax, Louisiana in 1873 uh, and in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1870, in, in 1898. That is clear to them. What's less clear to us, and this is the democracy part, is that the principal threat to a multiracial democracy is white supremacy. Because we're not taking it seriously enough, right? That, that, that a multiracial democracy can exist as long as you have white supremacy being treated as a legitimate way of operating in the world, as a legitimate political, political discourse. One year after January 6th, uh, the current president of the United States, Joe Biden, gave a very powerful um, speech. Um, his most powerful to date at that time, in which he talked about what had occurred the year before. He talked about the threat to democracy. Uh, and he talked about, and I was listening to the speech and I was like, oh, I was like, Yo, Joe, you're doing good. You're doing good, Joe. 
as he went on. And then he said, you know, that the political violence that we saw on January 6th uh, is fundamentally un-American. He said, this is not who we are. And I was like, Joe, I was with you up until that moment. But in that moment, you forgot your history, right? The use of political violence is exactly who we are, especially political violence motivated by racism. Right? I mean, what is the, uh, the American Revolution but political violence? What was the Civil War but political violence? What was lynching uh, and, 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 and the use of racial terrorism by the Klan to defeat, to try to defeat um, the civil rights movement, but political, but political violence. And what was January 6th, but political violence. So the question then becomes, who are we as a people, as a nation, if this, if we have this record of political violence? Well, anytime I encounter a challenging question, I always turn to James Baldwin, because he seems to have the answer. Uh, and James Baldwin said that we are our history, right? And, and this is so critically important. In order to understand the present, we have to make, in order to make sense of the present, we have to understand the past because we are our history. We are the product of our history. We are not responsible for the things that occurred in the past, uh, but we are the beneficiaries of it. We are the inheritors of it. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that not so that we avoid repeating it, but so that we can break the continuum so we can stop doing the things in the present that have created such difficulty in the past and that continue to create difficulty in the present, right? We gotta stop doing those things. We can only do those if we understand what occurred in the past. That means confronting hard history directly, but there are some challenges, obstacles to understanding the past in a frank and honest way. One of those obstacles is the myth of perpetual progress. Uh, that we suffer from here in the in the United States, the myth of perpetual progress. That yeah, things may have been bad at one point, but they always get better, right? Democracy may have been limited, but it always gets better, right? Racial progress, same thing, right? Yeah, there may have been slavery, uh, but 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 then we had the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, but you got Martin Luther King, right? And, and now you got Barack Obama and Beyonce, right? So things always get better. Perpetual progress this is the way things get better. This is America. But within that, we exclude those aspects of the past when things don't get better, right? Like the, like the American journey isn't just a uh, you know, perpetual ascent. It's, it's a whole lot of flat lines with a lot of dips and an occasional uptick, right? And so we have to understand that things don't always get better, right? Like in, in fact, things often get worse, right? We see that uh, in some of the, when we take a serious look at, at American history. And obstacle to understanding the past and the way in which it informs the present is this idea. And this is one of Martin Luther King's, I, I teach civil rights history at Ohio State, the Ohio State University. They trademark these, so I gotta say the now, the Ohio State University. The, the, one, one, one of Martin Luther King's most um, uh, uh, favorite, favorite saying was that the arc of the moral universe was long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that sounds really cool. And this tends to be one of the obstacles to us understanding the past as it connects to the present um, is because we often leave that understanding right there. Like the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So, so like it may take time, but, but time works. Time works its magic, right? That eventually we will get towards justice. But King explained, right? And he writes about this in the um, letter from uh, Birmingham jail. King explains that, that time itself is, is not a, is not a social force. Time is not capable of creating change. Time is just a unit of measure, right? In order to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice, people have to engage and exert the force necessary to bend it in that direction. Left to its own devices, that arc will continue to trend in the direction that it's going. And if that's towards injustice, then it will continue in that direction. And so, embracing this idea that, hey, if you just let things pass, let time pass, if you can just be patient, things will get better, actually works against uh, progress, actually works against bringing about a more just society. And, and these two things are, are, we're surrounded by this, right? Um, in, in our thinking, in our understanding of America's past and present. So what can we do about it? 
how do we break through um, this particular sort of way of thinking, this kind of, this kind of discourse? And I would argue that primary sources um, are critically important, especially when thinking about the classroom um, for students and for young people, that primary sources are critically important uh, for helping us, enabling us to break through. Why? Teaching at, I'll give you an example, right? When I, when I enter a classroom at, at the Ohio State University, and whether I'm teaching a US history course uh, with you know, a couple hundred students or an African-American uh, history course on the civil rights movement or African-American history group film that might have 60, 70 or 80 or so students. When I walk into that class, um, the vast majority of the students in that class will be white uh, because Ohio State is very white. Uh, it ain't a black college. Um, and my students at Ohio State are drawn from across the state, across the, across the nation to be sure, but from across the state. So we got you know, we got a handful of black students from urban spaces, but the majority of students, you know, are coming from suburbs and we still live in a segregated society. So these majority white suburbs attending schools that were 90% white, but they're coming from rural communities that were overwhelmingly white as well. So that means when they walk into the classroom, um, that for most of these white students, I am the first African-American that they will ever encounter who is in a position of authority in their, in that vis-a-vis uh, -vis them. Right. And all of the uh, cultural stereotypes um, that are percolating are often implicitly uh, in their minds are being projected at me. I had one student uh, who, who told me one time a few weeks into the in, into the semester, um, he said that uh, his, his, his grandmother uh, warned him about me, a little white kid from from from, you know, Appalachia. He said, his grandmother warned me, warned him about me. And my first question and response was, well, who's your grandmother, right? Like, you know, did she go to Morehouse College, right? I don't think so. Like, I don't, how do I know your grandmother? And he was like, no, no, no. He said, she doesn't know you. But she said she warned me about these liberal professors, right? You know, who are, who are, at, who are at, you know, Ohio State in these places, and they're going to try to, you know, convert you to, to what I'm not quite sure, but they're going to try to convert you away, you know, from, from, from your belief. So I understand that there is some skepticism, even though there's self-selection in my classes, right? About what is it that this dude, this brother up here is gonna be talking about. And so for, as I open my classes and for the first couple of weeks, I do very little speaking. I have to let the primary sources do the speaking and do the teaching. I can't let my voice be dominant because my voice will be dismissed. So I have to rely on primary sources to do the speaking, to do the teaching. And then once they have gotten enough, like, oh, wait a minute, there's some evidence here, right? There's some, there's some facts here, right? Then they begin to ask the questions, right, of me. Then I gain a little bit of credibility because I'm constantly referring and referencing to what's being spoken about, what's being documented in the sources themselves. So primary sources are critical, uh, especially at a time when there is so much skepticism about those who offer an honest critique of American, American society. So when thinking about democracy and that intersection between democracy and hard history, right, in this particular moment, what are some of the primary sources that I think that we should be drawing attention, attention to? Well, the first um, is the constitu state constitutional conventions that took place in the Deep South between 1890 and 1910, uh, starting in Mississippi in 1890. And this is a, a, a picture of the state, uh, Mississippi legislature uh, from 18, 1890. Um, every state in the former Confederacy rewrite their state constitution for the sole purpose of disenfranchising African-Americans. So this is, this is we're, about to, we're about to explode the myth of perpetual progress, right? Like civil war over, black folk get freedom. And so it's just a matter of time uh, because things are constantly, well, look, African-Americans are granted the right to vote in 18 with the 15th amendment. And then that vote is stolen. They're stripped, they're robbed of the right to exercise the franchise, right? And it, it, it's done through violence we see in Colfax, but then, and in the, in the, in the testimonies that are sent to, to Congress and the like, but then we see it in these constitutional conventions that are called for the sole purpose of taking a vote away from African-Americans. And they do it in a colorblind way because of the 15th Amendment says you can't discriminate on the basis of race. 
And so we see them putting in a literacy test and a poll tax and an understanding clause and all these other things. And I don't say, I don't just show my students the image of you know, these state legislatures here in Mississippi and say, hey, look, these white guys did this thing. I say, no, 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 don't take my word for it. You know, read the proceedings of these constitutional conventions, right? Now you can do Mississippi in 1890, you can do Virginia in 1901 or Alabama in 1901. They're all saying the same thing. They are quite clear. They can't talk about race in the legislation, right? But they in their constitutional and constitutional measures, but they sure as hell can talk about it in the proceedings. And that's what they do. They say time and time and time again, the only reason why we are here is to take the vote away from these black people, period. We don't believe that they should be voting. We believe in white supremacy. Using the primary source, the language, I don't gotta make anything up. Don't even have to summarize. I can say here, this is what they said. They put it all down on paper. That hard history of white supremacy, that makes us uncomfortable in the present. It didn't make them uncomfortable in the past, right? I mean, they are, they are free to speak their mind and to talk about, you know, we have to disenfranchise and we got to use violence, right? So the primary source, the proceedings, let the documents speak for themselves because the people are speaking for themselves uh, and trying. And this is critical because now what are we talking about? We're talking about shrinking democracy. Right, making this democracy look a little bit more like it did before the institution of slavery. The great irony is that this is trying to make America look like it did at the moment of the revolution, not the Civil War, but the moment of the American Revolution, where African Americans are, are, are disenfranchised, where women don't have the right to vote and the likes. So they ain't not just trying to go back to 1860, uh, 1865. They're trying to go back to 1776 in a different kind of way. Right, and we have to be clear. We have to be clear about that. Women's suffrage, thinking about democracy. The conversation about democracy has to be about its perpetual expansion, but only because people fought for it. And we can look at this, right? I mean, we have, we, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the, 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 the 19th Amendment. Uh, and too many of the general conversations were like, oh, it's unfortunate that women you know, didn't have protections until 1919. But I'm so glad you know, Congress uh, and the state legislatures you know, recognized that uh, that that women should have the right to vote, and it was granted to them through the 19th Amendment. Like that shouldn't be the narrative. I mean, women uh, and white women in particular are fighting for this. Black women are fighting for this, right? Fighting for the right to organizing, coming up with voters' leagues, petitioning state legislatures. We're fighting for it before the Civil War, after the Civil War, up until the 19th, up until um, the actual passage of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and Progress has this wonderful uh, collection of documents on women's suffrage including congressional testimony. And a congressional testimony is useful because again, it's the words of the people themselves, right? Not only women coming before and testifying on the importance and the right to vote and all the things that uh, are associated with it, but then also uh, listening and, and reading the responses, right? Of white male elected officials, right? Who are skeptical, uh, who are doubting uh, and all of the inherent gender bias that's captured there. We should not assume again, that, that the, the expansion of democracy either comes easy uh, or it comes willingly. Uh, and when we look at the documents connected to women's suffrage, uh, we, see, we see that powerful, uh, powerful example of change there. And we also see some of the limits, right? Saying that, because this is also the era in which African-Americans and black women are still being wholly disenfranchised. I mean, so that is very much at play and captured in these records at well, as well. We need to talk about the reality of Jim Crow right, Dem democracy, right? Because what is limiting democracy has always been race, the threat of racial violence and the actual use and practice of racial violence. Uh, primary sources are those uh, text-based sources, but then they're also images. Uh, and some of the most powerful images to come out of the Jim Crow era are these postcards uh, of lynchings that took place, pictures of lynchings that took place. Now, when, when using, uh, when talking about the American past, we're talking about history, and we're talking about, you know, these difficult subjects like Jim Crow. I mean, there, there are, and lynching in particular, you know, there's two things that I think we have to be cognizant of. Uh, we don't want to, or, or in, in terms of not wanting to do, we don't want to trivialize and we don't want to traumatize, right? We don't want to trivialize the subject and we don't want to traumatize uh, students and people who are, who are looking at this. So when looking at these lynching postcards, Often, very often, they capture, you know, the, the, the corpse. I mean, this is one of the things that was a part of, you know, early photography in this moment, turn of 20th century photography was creating these souvenir moments, uh, pictures of, 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 of white people, white men, white boys, white women, 
around the body of an African American that had been lynched off and burned um, beyond recognition. And because they couldn't get a, a, a physical piece of the body, a knuckle, uh, a bone, then these photographers would take these pictures so that they could then uh, walk away with a token of remembrance and share it with their family members. And so I have my students say, listen, y'all hadn't heard about lynching because most of them had it. Like, this is it. And this isn't some obscure um, incident that occurred one or two places, right? With people wearing hoods who were afraid of justice. I mean, these are pictures where people are posing and smiling and look at the faces, not of the body, but the faces of the people who have committed the crime, the children who are brought there. Right, the, the fact that they call these Negro barbecues, right? These were celebrations of white supremacy in which African-Americans were killed. And so the, the power of an image and staring into the faces of those who are celebrating this murder uh, is really telling about how democracy, limiting democracy uh, was maintained in the early uh, 20th century. And of course, ProQuest has these newspaper clippings um, of, of lynchings that took place, right? Documenting the lynching. And one of the things that can be done in having students look at these uh, newspaper clippings is to see where they come from, right? Because you will have different um, descriptions of what took place over time, uh, but then also depending upon where the paper, uh, where the story was being reported. Uh, one version occurs in Southern newspapers in these localities. Another telling of the, of, of the paper of, of, of the violence will occur in Northern newspapers. And then a third telling would occur in Black newspapers. And, and, and those Black newspapers capture the essence and the truth of what occurred, the motivation that occurred and the like. And so having students look at these different newspaper clippings, not only of the lynchings, but then also of lynchings that were prevented and avoided and the like, really speak to the reality of Jim Crow in, in ways that just describing or telling students what occurred um, uh, can't, can't really capture um, both the extent of it and the impact, the impact over time. When thinking about democracy, we also need to be thinking about the basic citizenship rights that people have. And when we look at American history, we got to think about those moments when basic citizenship rights were, were denied. Uh, ProQuest has uh, a number of primary sources uh, that I use in teaching American history on Japanese internment. Uh, and this is a map, a hand-drawn map of one of the incarceration camps uh, in, in Idaho uh, from 19, 1944. And, 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 and in addition to this, you know, there are you know, memos on, you know, how to, uh, you know, treat those who were found to be disloyal and when they could come out and who gets visitors and who can't get visitors and what should be talked about and how are, you know, uh, those Japanese citizens responding to their incarceration. I mean, all this and sort of military memos and documents, um, uh, you know, pictures drawn by young people who are um, uh, young internees uh, who are being held uh, hand-drawn pictures as a part of their schooling and education. So there's a lot that can be taken, right? This isn't just something that is like, oh, that's unfortunate, right? <laughs> that it occurred, if it even occurred. But no, 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 this is fundamental denial of basic citizenship rights here in the United States. And the students can really immerse themselves and brings it to life, right? When they see these, see these sources, the injustice of what was taking place and occurring. One of the things that I really try to get into uh, when exploring uh, the limits of American democracy, but then also the ways in which African Americans and other citizens uh, work to exert that force necessary to bend that arc, uh, is to look at uh, the organizational papers um, of civil rights, um, civil rights uh, organizations, right? Civil rights organizational papers. Now, these are, you know, the the ProQuest has. Uh, the uh, NAAC papers, NAACP papers, which are massive, right? But then they also have uh, the papers of smaller organizations, right? More local organizations, not only SCLC, which is a national organization, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was King's organization, but also Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, right? And, you know, I especially like looking at the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the work of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee around voting rights, because so much of the material speaks directly 
um, in the voice of the people, in the voice of African Americans who are so often marginalized, speaking not only to their experiences, but then also to their desires, right? Uh, and this is a, a, a letter, a cover letter, a cover sheet um, being that is sent out in the process of bringing about a more democratic society, uh, being sent out to um, supporters of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964, um, and, and, and this was disenfranchised African-Americans in Mississippi uh, who were trying to draw attention to their disenfranchisement and bringing their plight uh, before the nation at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City in 1964. And if you look closely, uh, this, this cover letter is written uh, and signed by uh, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, one of the leading lights of the, of the grassroots movement in Mississippi. Uh, you will see one of the things too that is so critically important that you can do with primary sources is not only get at the ways in which African Americans and others are organizing to give, breathe life into American democracy, uh, but it also allows us to do um, some truth telling, some fact finding. Because one of the things um, that we encounter when thinking about the American past, but then especially when thinking about um, African American history as it relates to the American past, is that there's a whole lot of unlearning that has to be done before we can get to some real learning, right? And one of these things, for example, uh, that has to be unlearned is this idea that Martin Luther King was someone uh, who was just celebrated, right? From the moment um, he arrives on the scene uh, until the day of his, uh, day of his death. Uh, one of the things that we see, primary sources that we find in, in the History Vault ProQuest collection uh, are the FBI files, uh, the FBI file on Martin Luther King, uh, in which we see, for example, um, the FBI talking about a confidential source uh, who was reliable uh, because the FBI and the U.S. government had been monitoring King uh, for more than a decade. Uh, even before the Montgomery bus boycott, he was on their, on their radar. Um, the this idea that uh, you know the, the way in which change occurred, America has become more democratic. Is black folk raised their voice, white Southerners were like, "Oh, we didn't realize that y'all want a little bit of freedom," and the federal government was right there, hand in hand, to support them. Right. So there's a lot of unlearning that has to be done. And when you look at these files, the FBI files, and some of those papers uh, as well, we're able to separate some of that fact from fiction. There's a couple more slides, and then I'll then I'll open it back up. With every, with every revolution comes a counter-revolution. Uh, and the, the effort to expand democracy in America in the mid 20th century meets a counter-revolution. Uh, and that counter-revolution is embodied in the efforts of uh, white Southerners um, to not only maintain Jim Crow, but to keep African-Americans from gaining a political voice and political power. Uh, this leads the Republican Party nationally to pursue um, those disaffected white Southerners, and this is uh, uh, Richard Nixon's Southern strategy that really reaches, um, that comes into full fruition uh, in 1980 uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan uh, being elected to elected president of the United States. Interestingly, Ronald Reagan, when he announces his bid for office, uh, his bid for the White House, former governor of California. He doesn't announce that bid for office in California. He doesn't do it in Washington, DC. He doesn't do it in a, the swing state of Ohio. He doesn't do it in New York, which he'll try to carry, right? Where does he do it? Uh, he does it in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Neshoba County, Mississippi. Ain't nothing ever happened in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Why the hell is he in Neshoba County, Mississippi? Because this is where four civil, three civil rights workers um, were murdered. Uh, in 1964, because Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan is signaling that this expansion of democracy uh, that white Southerners are viewing as a threat to them, as taking something away from them, that he is sympathetic to them, and that in Reagan's America, uh, that that will be something that he will consider uh, in his policies going forward, right? And this isn't an accident, right? I had one student, you know, said, you know, said, well, Dr. Jeffries, you know, you know, maybe maybe it was just an accident that he, you know, uh, he didn't understand what, was, what happened in Neshoba County, Mississippi. I'm like, what do you think his bus broke down? And he was like, well, it's a good place as any to, to, to launch the campaign. No, this was signaling um, to white Southerners, right? That, 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 that I understand your pain, 
And even if that pain drove you to the point of violence, uh, there's still a place for you in this new in this new GOP. That being said, that being said, despite the appeal to white supremacists to come into uh, and support the Democratic Party, you still had Ronald Reagan reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act. And so there are a number of documents that talk about voting rights moving in, out of the 1960s into the 1980s uh, and 90s that talk about you know, um, you know, efforts on the part of um, the Reagan administration, that, you know, also within the Justice Department, they're coming down, you know, these, are, these aren't, you know, they've got serious issues, coming down on newly elected black elected officials. But here we have a statement by the president talking about the Voting Rights Act. For this nation to remain true to its principles, we cannot allow any American's vote to be denied, diluted, or defiled, right? I mean, at least on paper, he gets it, right? Like, like less, yes, you know, let's actually, uh, there's a history of voter discrimination, uh, and I may try with my administration to kind of get around it, but on the surface of it, I realize that, you know, in a democracy, the vote is fundamental, and we have to do what is necessary to protect it. And that was the whole point of the Voting Rights Act in the first. So even in this moment where this counter-revolutionary action in response to the enfranchisement, re-enfranchisement of African-Americans, even somebody like Ronald Reagan gets it and would reauthorize it, right? That would not be the case going forward. Fast forward um, 30, 30, 40 years in 2013, um, the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, in the case of Shelby County versus uh, Holder, uh, in 2013, uh, gut the Voting Rights Act uh, by saying that the formula used to identify those places that need to uh, have their, uh, need to pre-clear any changes to, to their voting laws, uh, that that formula needs to be changed, knowing darn well that the formula was still effective and if anything needed to be expanded, but that under the uh, Republican controlled um, uh, uh, under the, under, with the new GOP that they were not in any way, despite, uh, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan voting for reauthorization, despite um, others voting for reauthorization through the years, um, that it wasn't going to happen. And so what happens then uh, is that in this, in this ruling, uh, you know, thinking about the primary source as well, is going forward into the era of the new Roberts Court that we are now in, dissents are going to be critical for understanding and interpreting what's happening. Uh, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a former justice of the Supreme Court, actually offers one of her most powerful dissents uh, in Shelby versus Holder, in which she writes, throwing out the Voting Rights Act when it has worked is continue and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. It's stupid, right? If it's working, you can't then say that, ah, we don't need it anymore because we're not getting wet. We're not seeing it. You're not, you're not getting wet because you have something that is actually blocking it, blocking the rain. And so the Supreme Court dissents are another kind of primary source that are worth sharing with people. Say, look at this, because this is going to be meaningful, helping to interpret and put into context some of these rulings uh, that we're seeing, not just in voting rights, but in reproductive justice and these other and these the separation of church and state um, that we're seeing coming down the pike. If Shelby v. Holder opened the voting, uh, opened the floodgates to voter suppression laws, then the flood that is, is what we have seen uh, beginning in January, picking up steam over after Shelby versus Holder, but certainly beginning in January of, 20, of, of 2021, uh, when so many states, in Georgia, starting in Georgia and just spreading like wildfire, uh, would introduce and then pass bills restricting ballot access. And again, based upon this false premise, based drawing on the big lie, but based upon this false premise that somehow, you know, these votes, the, 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 the integrity of the uh, electoral system in America is being challenged. You know, votes have never been safer in America, right? But, but, but now suddenly we got to have, you know, new, you know, voter IDs to prevent voter impersonation. Uh, ain't nobody impersonating voters in America. Americans don't even vote, right, as a whole, right? So we don't need that. Now, now, you know, there are a couple of Republicans that tend to vote two or three times, you know, in, in an election. But, you know, aside from them, right, there's no voter impersonation problem. We don't have any massive voter fraud, and yet we have these bills. And so we have to put these bills into proper context in order to understand where they're coming from and, and, and the real danger and threat that they pose. 
right, to, to not just expanding democracy, but to preserving democracy. And our students, I think, if we walk them through and show them these primary sources, right, about how democracy has been fought for and how it has been sustained, but then also the ways in which an undemocratic tradition has existed uh, with mass support in America and, and, and can become dominant again, just as we have, are seeing now, how that can occur and has, and has a, uh, um, uh, the blueprint for that exists is something that we need to take seriously in this particular moment. And so I, I, I'll just wrap up with there and we can transition. I'll stop sharing my screen. We can transition for the next few minutes. I don't know if anybody's still there. Actually, I could just be talking to myself, but maybe there's a question or two. Barb will come back and let me know. We're uh, still here. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. And then, and then maybe we could open it up to some questions that might have come through. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much. You did not disappoint. We've got some really interesting questions here. So I would want to look at one. So one is from Joe, who says, as an archivist in rural Appalachia, I struggle to collect primary sources that detail the experiences of minority populations and tend to fall back on oral history projects to fill in the gaps. However, very few individuals will participate for fear of reprisal. What do you think are the best ways to build trust with communities not traditionally represented within the archives to communicate the importance of creating these primary sources and to alleviate their anxiety about participating in history gathering projects? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, it, and it's a legitimate question. Uh, I, I don't think we can force ourselves upon communities that have a justifiable reason, right? Given history to, to be hesitant. I think the, 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 the best way um, is, is what you've laid out, right? Is to make the case, to make the argument, right? For its importance, to acknowledge the past, right? To acknowledge the marginalization in the past, to say like, look, and to explain that this is a, a, a conscious attempt um, to be more inclusive. I think pointing to other um, projects and programs that have done this successfully and saying, look, Look at what's been done over here. This is something that we want to replicate here. But I think in the end, what's really important is to convey that this isn't a one-way street, uh, that this isn't uh, you or me, as because I do oral history as well, just showing up, taking a recording and leaving, but this is a collaborative process. And so you're inviting them in, not just as subjects, but as stakeholders uh, in, the, in the telling of this history, in the documenting of this history, and so that they have an investment, so that they know and feel secure in the fact that what they share will not be twisted or will not be tossed aside because they'll be instrumental in the, in the framing of that as well. And I think, I think you'll have a, you know, there, there will be skepticism, there will be hesitancy, and that, that just comes with the territory because that's part of the history. And we have to you know, acknowledge that up front, right? Not get angry and frustrated. Like, no, I, I get it, right? You, you, you shoulder all that baggage as you go in. But then inviting collaboration and partnership um, can really begin to break down those barriers. And, I, and I'm pretty sure in time, because Black folk, marginalized can be people, Black people, whether they're in Appalachia or in Brooklyn, New York, they're, they're history telling people, right? They, they understand the, the importance of preservation and documenting this. It's just a matter of who's, who's going to do it. And can we trust the people uh, who, are, who are approaching us? Cool. Great. Thank you. A uh, practical question. How much reading are you assigning in different level courses, including primary and secondary sources? Are you assigning them outside of class or just giving them into class to read and look at together? I'm thinking about a standard survey course textbook has about 20 to 30 pages a week. And then how many primary sources to assign on top of that? Yeah, so I assign a lot less reading today than I did 10 years ago, probably about 60% less. Um, and instead, because kids aren't reading as much as they look, we're not solving the reading problem in our classrooms, right? And so rather than assigning more reading, um, I actually tend to use a sort of multimedia approach. Um, so I'll assign some reading, I'll assign some video clips, I'll assign some documentaries, um, I'll assign some primary sources to read on their own. I'll also do some primary source um, deep dives in class um, you know, together. So it depends on how long it is. So I think the shorter the long is I really try to mix it up. I have found that, uh, and I also try to move away from textbooks uh, wherever possible. Um, but then if, you're, if you are using a textbook, I think the supplement for the primary source, it becomes so critical 
like even more so in a survey class that is a textbook base that may have some primary sources in the in the margins. I don't even use those, or at least I try to pull those out and have them look at literally pull them out of the book and have them printed before them so that it takes on something other than sort of um, the feeling of this just being part of a textbook, right? Like once you're able to kind of hold it in their hand or at least see it separately, then that can be something that they can really sink their teeth into. So, you know, I try to limit the amount of reading, uh, but then I also try to do deep dives in primary sources. I don't assign primary sources and not come back to it, right? So if I assign it separately, I then try to have them come into the classroom so that we can discuss it. Uh, we can discuss it. Okay, great. So um, another person writes in, I'm currently working with JSTOR's Reveal Digital team, creating educational content for their American prison newspapers collection. The collection is comprised of newspapers written and published in prison by incarcerated people. What tips do you have for making educational content that allows teachers and instructors to engage with this collection in a critical and meaningful way? I think you might be, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, that's a great question. And, 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 it's, and it's a wonderful project if I understand it rightly, um, correctly. You know, we are dealing with an increasing prison population and of people who are incarcerated, but then also people who have come out of prison, formerly incarcerated folks. Um, and one of the things that allows for the, that has allowed for the massive population, uh, prison population boom, has been the dehumanization of people who have, um, you know, who are convicted and sent to prison, right? Uh, most for nonviolent, you know, nonviolent drug offenses. But it's this dehumanization process and this hypercriminalization where we no longer really see them as full, complete human beings, right? Um, so looking at material that they are producing that allows us as outsiders to take them seriously as people, as thinkers, um, I think is wonderful. But I think the work that has to be done in using that is providing a broader context, right? A context for the rise in mass incarceration, the connection to the war on drugs, who's in prison, why are people in prison, what are the collateral consequences uh, for coming out of prison, uh, you know, once people come out of prison and reentry. I think we have to, I think in using that as a source, there has to be some work done so that the, the students uh, or people who are who are consuming the source uh, have a real understanding of the way in which the carceral state works. Um, that 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 sometimes uh, mostly crime is not what actually people do. The crime is just what police police people doing, right? I mean, so there's a, it requires a little bit of reimagining uh, and reunderstanding, some unlearning to do some learning before we can dig down and take that, that, that kind of primary source serious, but it's really important. That, 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 that's excellent. I like that idea. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question, but I do want to thank everybody for sending in your questions because there's some good ones here and we'll try to get answers and send them back to all of you. But the last question we'll have time for today, and it's, it's a big one. So <laughs> it says a lot of what we're talking about is very violent. How can we unpack history that's no less destructive but not quite as visceral. I'm thinking specifically on how the US government was designed from day one to create structural inequalities, et cetera. So one of the challenges with, you know, with confronting this now, right, is, you know, I had, I had a student who asked me after assigning um, a first day of class, I assigned a uh, documentary, Slavery by Another Name, which is on convict leasing. Um, and she sent me a note and said, Dr. Jeffries, this is a very powerful film, but there's some, there's some difficult material that's covered in it. And, you know, maybe for, maybe it would have been good to give a trigger warning, right, to, to the students. Um, and I wrote back and said, you know what, we were just moving on to Zoom. I said, you know, I usually say something about the content of the class, uh, and I didn't do it, you know, so thank you very much for reminding me. And so when class convened, you know, I, I shared that, you know, one of the classmates had brought this to my attention. And I said, so, you know, I said, let me give you my, you know, my standard warning. Um, about this content. This is American history. It's all, it's all triggering, right? I mean, like, this is some rough stuff. We talk about, you know, violence. We're talking about murder. We're talking about genocide. We're talking about theft of land. We're talking about disenfranchisement. I mean, wh when is it easy, right? We don't deal with the Disney version of the past, right? And so I think we have to, you know, 
we have to lean into and accept the that those difficult aspects of our past that say, look, this makes us uncomfortable. Like, yeah, it should make you uncomfortable, right? Like American history should absolutely make you uncomfortable. If you can look at American history, right, and come out on the other end comfortable, I don't know what version of the American past that you were looking at, right? It, it just, it, there's some Disney version that just ain't true. And so I think that is the starting point to say, look, this is some difficult stuff, like from the very beginning, right? And it doesn't get any easier. But that doesn't mean there aren't moments in there that we should focus on to celebrate sort of the triumph of the human spirit, even though that doesn't mean that we have overcome, right? Whatever, whatever, whatever we're talking about for whatever particular marginalized group. It means that we have to understand the context and the way in which change and democratic expansion has been brought about. And so I think, I think the point is right. Like, look, they're, they're, this is some hard stuff, uh, but that doesn't mean we should shy away from it. That doesn't mean that we should pretend as though it doesn't exist. That means we should dig deeper to understand it, use those primary sources to make this stuff clear. And then we would have a better understanding of that so we can have a better understanding of who we are today and how we got here. And then in the end, Barbara, all of this is so that the students that we are working with those who are responsible, not for the past or for the present, but for the future, for tomorrow, that they are in a better place to make those tough decisions and make this place a little bit better than what we're leaving it, um, us today, than what we're leaving them with uh, going, going forward. For sure. So this was amazing, Dr. Jeffries. Thank you so much. There's lots of compliments in the chat, so you're going to want to read those as well. But uh, thank you all for attending and staying on a few minutes past. And I hope you all stay well. And thanks very much for your time today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll just remind you that we do have a survey you can fill out briefly um, to offer your feedback and your comments. And also, we did record today's session, so you can expect an email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. So thanks again to Dr. Jeffries for speaking today. This was a really instructive and important discussion. And thank you to Barbara for moderating the Q&A. And thank you to our attendees for your questions and comments. Thank you, Sabrina. Take care. Bye.